Okay, so well, welcome to this um, first in a series of webcasts we're going to be producing in the run-up to this year's Travolution European Summit, which is going to take place in London on May the 4th. Um, today, we've got one of the companies uh, that will be represented at that uh, event um, to speak to. We're going to speak to the founder and CEO of Impala, Ben Stevenson. We've actually got uh, the company's chief operating officer, Lionel speaking uh, um, at the event. He's previously worked for um, for Google with their Nest division. So he's going to be talking about um, what he's learned in B two C tech and how that can be applied in the B two B world. But we thought it'd be quite a good idea to have a chat with with Ben today in the run up to the event and uh, listen, uh, hear hear a bit about Impala and about some of his thoughts about what Impala is all about, what it's trying to do in travel, and a bit about the industry in, in itself. So uh, welcome, Ben. Thanks for joining us today from from, from sunny Barcelona, I believe. Indeed, hey Lee, very good, very good to join. Um, it, it is, it is obscenely sunny, especially at a time where like Storm Eunice or whatever, whichever storm we're on now is battering the UK. I feel yeah, pretty yeah. We, we, we seem to be over the worst of it over here. So, um, so thankfully, um, yeah, th thanks for joining us, Ben, today. Um, let, let's let's start off by just a bit of intro to yourself. Um, you, you, you're not from a travel background, but let to tell us about who you are, where you came from, and how you ended up being, being in travel and founding Impala. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, broadly, we we see. Impala is sitting at the intersection of, of two huge mega trends, one being clearly travel, which I don't need to tell this audience about, and then the other one being software eating the world and people being able to create businesses, um, you know, in back bedrooms rather than in, in the offices of bank managers. Um, and so, you know, that, that sort of little second world is where I'm from. So I was there uh, as a software engineer, self-taught software engineer for, for many, many years. Um, various different places around the UK. And they ended up taking a job as the head of engineering for a luxury concierge firm in central London, um, which was was very exciting. They called me up and they said, hey, you know, this is this, you know, do you want this this gig? And I said, well, it's luxury, it's traveling, it's the head of something, so it ticks all the boxes I'm looking for. Um, and um, I'm just kidding, I'm not, not super despotic like that. Um, mm. But but it sounded it sounded like a great gig. And and this company essentially they had you know, piles and piles of cash, lots and lots of subscribers. Um, and they wanted to do something which was, to my eyes, you know, extraordinarily, you know, extraordinarily exciting. Um, and it was my first introduction to the travel, to the business of travel rather than just, you know, travel in general. What they wanted to do was they wanted to build a digital experience or essentially a booking experience that would allow you to pick specific floors in the hotel and see the view before you left. Um, they would allow you to, if you were a disabled traveler, know the exact widths of doorways. Um, if you were traveling with a family, you know, you would have an adjoining room by default. You wouldn't have to call up the hotel. And they had all these really interesting ideas for the way that they wanted to sell travel in the future. And I thought that's that's fantastic. We live in a world where, you know, ultimately the, the large OTAs out there, which most people tend to book with or even tour operators, it tends to be highly restrictive. And, you know, it's like, well, check in, check out, you know, location. And then a bunch of room types that may or may not have some something interesting and descriptive about them. Um, yeah. And so I, I was totally on board with this. Um, and then I spent the next two years of my life banging my head against a brick wall, um, figuring out that actually not only was this pretty much impossible, but there were thousands of people around the, uh, around the world of travel that were, were had had similar ideas, but were unable to bring them to fruition. And that actually the problem wasn't a lack of creativity, right? Like, you know, there wasn't a lack of people that, you know, really, really hated the same booking experience or a lack of people that, you know, thought check-in took too long or a lack of people that were, were you know, didn't enjoy the, the expectation gap between what you think you're going to get and what you get in a, in a room type, um, but rather just the technology didn't support people doing anything about it. Um, yeah. And so quite unusually, um, it became my life's mission to, to sort of change the infrastructure layer for an industry. Um, because, uh, you know, we saw in, in other industries some tremendous companies being built doing that, like Plaid and Twilio and Stripe and even Shopify or AWS, you can think of as companies that, that came in and redefined the infrastructure layer. Um, and, and, you know, we felt that, like, that was the thing to do to, to, really, to really change the way, that, uh, to really improve an industry. How long ago was, was that? So when was the, when was the company founded? You, you worked with this concierge, then you decided to sort of break out of that and create the startup? Yeah, indeed. So we we essentially twenty seven late twenty seventeen was the moment that that I I felt okay, great. Like you know, I, I I'm I'm I have an, an enough of a sense of what we need to do to be able to crack on and get on with it. And by the way, I had no idea. <laughs> you know, like in, in retrospect, you know, at the time it was like, oh, you know, I really understand what we need to build, and, and I, I really had no clue. And four years later, I think I look back and think about that naivety. Um, but founded the business. Really, the business was founded sort of September November twenty seventeen. 
Okay. And 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 you've grown well since that in that period. I mean, you've you've got some good um respected backers and investors. So tell us about those guys. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I, I think you know, fundraising can always be an indicator of um and there was an interesting quote that I saw recently, which was that, you know, raising the, the early stage fundraising is about someone lending you that credibility so that you can go off and build a team and a product. And, um, and you know, certainly we have, I would say, you know, pretty highly credible investors, you know, Lakestar, or one of the, I think, the largest fund in, in uh, largest venture fund in Europe, um, Latitude, local global, a tremendous seed fund here in, or not here, I'm in Barcelona, but in, in London, um, yeah. and some great investors that are backed, you know, Airbnb and Secret Escapes and um, Deliveroo and PillPack and, and, and some incredible companies. Um, since, you know, use that, use that kind of capital to build out the product and build out the sort of initial, you know, initial market and build out an incredible team. Yeah. And what is it, what is it, what is it think they see in, in Impala then? What, what, what's, the, what's the bet they're making? Is it about going back to that original vision that you had about making this experience of um, booking, I mean, it's very focused on hotels, but I suppose what you said about hotels could be, you could say the same for booking flights or all sorts of elements of, of, of travel, making it more, more personalized and, and more relevant to the, to the user. Is, is, that yeah. the vision, is that the vision that they see, uh, that you've got, that they see as being the one that's gonna to start to win out in, in the travel industry as we, as we move on? Well, I, I think, that, you know, first of all, what do they see in the travel space? They see an enormous industry. Um, and I think like if you're an investor, then enormous industries are like, you know, are always really exciting, right? Because it's like, okay, great. If we can crack that, then there's like, you know, the upside is 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 phenomenal. Um, and so, you know, travel might be, I, th I think, is this, you know, the fourth largest um, discretionary consumer spend. It is the, you know, I, I you can't remember the exact phrasing, but, you know, when asked, what the um what you know they would they would do with more money people tend to say travel is one of the first two things the other one being buying a house buying a bigger house and so it, it's this, this this tremendously large market and i think that what we see in you know what we've seen since 2010 is a shift of these very very large markets um into a world of highly specialized providers right so you see the the experience getting a lot lot better because you go from a world where you know, it's just Amazon selling you something to a world where like it's 10,000 stores backed by Shopify or Etsy or whoever it might be, like really giving you the experience that you want. Um, and I think that they, as you know, as much as, you know, I do, or as much as, you know, people that have been in travel for, for 20, 30 years do see an industry that there are many, many improvements yet to come and many, many improvements that, you know, where there could be personalization, that could be pricing, that could be subscription or business models. There's so many different things that we can improve on, on in, in travel. And there are so many people trying to do that, by the way. This is like fictional, right? There are so many people trying to do that. Um, and the difficulty has always been in the travel space. Well, how do you, like, ultimately, those people tend to be geographically dispersed. They tend to have not massive access to lots of technical capability. And so what Impala essentially does is it says, well, Great, there is a, a, a whole world of change that's, you know, a whole world of pent up change that's within the industry. And if we can provide that technical know how, if we can provide that infrastructure that people can build on top of, then, you know, it's, it's going to be in a very different industry. And that inherently, I think, for our investors represents something that's incredibly valuable. And, and, and technically, without getting into too much details on the, on the, on the tech, you, you're a tech, you're a tech person by, you know, um, by your, in terms of your, um, where you come from. But, but technically speaking, you're, you're talking about, you've got a, a, APIs basically, which is this API technology, which seems to be the thing everyone's talking about. Just, just for the layman, explain what, what API technology is and why it changes things. Yeah, absolutely. So in the, in the very, very old days, prior to the idea of open APIs, what we would call open APIs today, um, you had a world where um, in order for two systems to work together, they had to re they had to reach bespoke arrangements and have bespoke um, technology built to allow two systems to work together. Right. So the the classic example that you'd always come up with um, is something like if you were sat at home or you know if you were running a small business thing, you know, and you did all your payroll in one piece of software, and then you did your sort of you know your your bank reconciliation in another piece of software, and you had to copy and paste lots of things you know back and forth. And it's you know you always used to think, well, why don't these two systems speak to each other? Why don't yeah. these two pieces of software? But it would save me shit loads. So save me a lot of time. Um, and and the reason that they didn't speak to each other is because in order for, for them to do so, those two companies, those two software companies, would have to go off 
and reach agreements about who was going to pay for the technology they'd have to build for, for them to communicate. There'd have to be some, you know, pilots run with potential customers to ensure that it was commercially worthwhile. And it was all very time consuming and expensive. Yeah. What, what an open API is, is essentially um, a third party service which says, hey, anyone that wants to work together, you don't have to deal with any of that, you can just connect to us. And, and we deal with all of that, you know, that information transfer. We, you know, we have a standardized model that allows people to connect to us so they don't have to spend you know, years and years and years in all of these negotiations. And so the real revolution of open APIs for someone that's sat at, at home or wherever it might be, or someone sat in a hotel in, in our case, is that the systems that you want to work with, the companies that you want to work with, you can do so at the drop of a hat. You don't have to wait. You don't have to sort of convince the people to start working together. It saves everyone time. Um, and, and that tends to be what you'll have seen, actually. Uh, one, one place where consumers will have certainly seen the impact of open APIs in their everyday life is if you just open your phone. And if you go to your phone and you take a look at the text, the SMS part of your phone, you'll see that actually, you know, today there's most of your SMS is probably come from businesses, right? So whether that's like, you know, verify that it's you logging into your Amazon account or like, hey, by the way, your delivery is on the way. What you can see there is lots and lots of text messages. And in the olden days, you never used to get that. And it's because the, the, the systems that wanted to send you messages couldn't integrate or couldn't connect to the, the people that could send that. Nowadays, there's a really famous company called Twilio that enables all that through open APIs. So it has a real genuine benefit to the consumer. Yeah. Oh, and, and one of the, I guess, uh, I guess one of the, uh, issues with the old way of doing things, which is still, in many respects, the, the, still the same way, the way it's done today, mm -hmm. is that uh, in, the, in a less open technology environment, you end up having very strong gatekeepers, don't you, I guess, who, who control that, that, that movement of, of information. And, 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 that is, and that is what is maybe, does that, is that, does that prevent um, uh, the industry advancing, do you think? Uh, and is it time that, that maybe that that those those blockages are are, are are dealt with, and this this is what this is why your time is now. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. So so we call it open distribution, right? Ultimately, like the open APIs in the travel selling space or in the hotel selling space um, yeah. is a category called open distribution, and we're one mm -hmm. provider in that, the market leading provider, and then there are several other providers as well that are starting to to enter the space. What they what the promise of that is of open distribution in the hotel space is that you can build in a way without needing to speak to a gatekeeper um, in a way that allows you to build a profitable um, business that isn't reliant on some you know monopolistic third party. So yeah. let's say that you and I five years ago said, listen, you know, you know, we're gonna leave our cushy jobs and we're gonna create an, an online travel agent that is focused on. Um, ensuring that um, disabled travelers always had the, the right layout for them. And maybe what you could do is you could, we could have a form that you'd fill in, which said, you know, what are your specific requirements and preferences? And, and we would go off and, and make sure that all the results that we'd shown you for a specific city factor that in, right? Sounds great, sounds wonderful. I, I'm sure you'd get a bunch of market share. The problem is in you know, five years ago, the only way for you to see that vision realized would be to either go to individually to every hotel that you could possibly want to work with, there's tens, tens and tens of thousands, which is impossible, right? Um, or go and connect to someone that already had that information, which is essentially booking.com and Expedia. Um, now, the difficulty there is that they're big gatekeepers, right? So they have a, a and, and you know, in many ways, great companies doing in really interesting things um, themselves. But what they don't want you to do is build extremely big profitable businesses that are taking customers away from them. What they don't want you to do is sell things in a way that they're not selling them because clearly that's a better traveler experience. And so it was very, you know, not impossible for anyone to build these businesses before. So the question that I always get asked when I talk about what I'm doing is like, you know, it's like, listen, you know, someone saying I have a very specific thing. You know, I, I always travel with my dog or, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm um, you know, I only want to stay in an LGD, LG, LGBTQ friendly places. You know, why isn't there a really great, you know, site for me? Why isn't there a really great application for me to book? And ultimately, it's because like nine times out of ten, it's impossible. It's been impossible for those people to really build big businesses and yeah. really build businesses that that are differentiated in any way. Yeah. So, so it's, it sounds like this is a, sort of the next stage in in disintermediation potentially. You know, I, I suppose when the internet came along, and for as long as it's been the internet and technology. It's the promise of disintermediation has always been there. And yet actually what's happened often is that another intermediary has popped up like the OTAs that like you mentioned, or then you've got review sites like TripAdvisor, then you've got maybe channel managers have come in. So there's always another intermediary prepared to sort of sit in the, sit in the middle. 
because there's a job to be done there. So is, is this is this actual disintermediation or is it a, a new a new generation of intermediaries such as yourself just doing things in a different way? So, so that's, a, that's a great question, which is, you know, I, I totally agree. The promise of the internet has always been like the a disintermediation. So one of the things that we really think of as our job is to ensure that, you know, on one hand we have hotels and on the other hand we have people that are selling hotel rooms and that our job is to make them, is to make it really easy for them to have a direct conversation. Yep. Um, and, and by conversation, we mean data transfer, by conversation, we mean com arranging commercial terms. That's what we're here to do. And I think what you've seen, you know, where disintermediation has been promised, but not necessarily arrived, is that, you know, ultimately those people that sit in the middle, whether that's a channel manager, whether that's the, you know, the partner services of, of one of the large OTAs, or whether that's a global distribution system, the difficulty has been that they have other, you know, they have other interests, right? They have some other purpose that they need to serve. So, um, you know, a channel manager clearly has the, the purpose that they serve is continuing to get SaaS fees from hotels and continuing to charge very high transactional fees. You know, the GDS is clearly looking at airlines and, and really not wanting to move out of, you know, moving beyond their TMC relationships. And, and clearly we talked about booking and speed and the large OTA partnerships. And so it's very difficult for them to actually facilitate a direct conversation because they're always thinking about their other line of business, their other strategic requirements. And so for Impala, what we essentially say is, listen, we're open. You can connect in from either, you know, we'll connect to any hotel, we'll connect to any customer that wants to sell hotel room without, without any restrictions. The only yeah. restrictions being that it has to be very transparent. Um, so you can't resell beyond that. Um, and, and our job is to facilitate direct conversations between two parties and not be the person that chooses who those parties are on either side for some other reason. Yeah. And so it, it's, it sounds like what this then um, opens up the possibility of is, is for really um, what, what you might call niche um, players to come in, but uh, there may be not some niche because if you talk about the LGBTQ market, that, that's maybe a niche market, but it's enormous. Or you can talk about the disabled or, or the market of people who need just additional information about rooms because they have some form of disability. That again, looks sounds like a niche, but in fact, it's probably a very huge niche, particularly if you look at it globally or internationally. So, so is, is, is this what this sort of ends up being a sort of, we, turn, we become a market where big uh, sort of generic OTAs become less valuable to people and they'll, they'll go and find specific brands which really understand them as a customer and, and therefore they get a better product and service. Yeah, in, indeed. I, I think there's always a place for those large sort of su supermarket style OTAs, right? Like, you know, if you want to just grab a room, a room last minute, you know, somewhere in, in, in Central Europe in a big city, then maybe one of those large OTAs makes sense, right? Um, and, and that might always be the case. But indeed, what we see is the birth of sort of three different kinds of um, new seller, which is really exciting. On the, on the one hand, you've got exactly what you've just described, these niche sellers who feel that they can cater to an, a specific audience much better than a generic service ever could do. And that's not just in terms of the curation of the kinds of places that you might want to stay, which is, I think, fairly evident as to why that might be, if, you know, thinking about some sort of you know, religious or LGBTQ plus travel. Um, but additionally, in the kinds of experience you can expect and that you can book through them. Um, so, you know, we gave that example earlier about adjoining rooms for families, but you can equally think of, um, you know, think of rooms that are equipped with, um, you know, specific facilities for, 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 um, for whatever the niche that you might have, I say niche, whatever the, 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 um, the, the particular group that you might identify with would be. And so you certainly get that, that increase in niche and, and geographically targeted OTAs and tour operators. What we're also seeing is that there are there's a growing demand um, from people that from or from applications or from services or products that already have you as a customer and understand you quite deeply to start selling travel as well. Um, yeah. And I think one place this is really obvious is in neo banks where they feel actually that um, they really understand your spending pattern. They really understand why you know the kinds of things that you like. And they feel that they also know the moment that you might want to start traveling um, through your sort of general spending patterns. And mm -hmm. so you start to see companies that already have you as a customer wanting to bundle in travel. So Rappi in, in South America is a really good example, Paytm in India, Revolut in the UK, and there's countless other examples. And so 
we would just see more and more of a move towards that. And the, the advantage that they have is that they don't have to spend versus booking an Expedia on, on Google Ads, right? Um, and yeah. that they already have you as a customer and they can capture your discovery stage. And then the final space is the sort of, I guess, like the wildcard startup area where, you know, there's just people that are doing quite interesting things and thinking about travel in different ways. And some examples of that, you know, we have companies that are, are working on business models that allow you to subscribe to travel. Um, and, you know, maybe you're a digital nomad and you want to roam quite freely and pay a set fee. We have companies that work on that. We have OTAs focused on people that want to stay somewhere where they can also work. We have OTAs focused on, like, you know, people that are building, you know, people that are selling weddings. And it, it's all very interesting in that space, yeah. And, what, and what's, what's your feeling then about the industry's appetite for change? It, 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 it does require change, this kind of thing, and, and there's legacies, you know, still throughout the industry. You know it now very well, uh, having come in from the outside. Do, do, are you optimistic that, I mean, has COVID changed, changed the, um, the, the calculation about, the, the risk calculation about change? And, and, and are you optimistic about the industry's readiness to, to, to really face this and, 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 and take the risks to do things completely differently? So, so our, our vision, I guess our, our vision statement is travel the way you imagine, right? And, and the initial version of that or the initial understanding of that might be like, okay, great. So I, as a, um, as a traveler, will get to have the travel that I imagined that I would get because I clearly have like a more niche or, or more specific provider of that travel. But actually, you know, that, that's not what it, that's not the only thing that it speaks to. It also speaks to the passion that people in this industry have for travel. There's, there's an extent to which, like, and I, I listen, I wouldn't claim to know travel, you know, in, 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 you know, in depth, I've been in it for five, six years, and I'm sure that there's, you know, hundreds of years of knowledge that I don't have, right? But one thing that always strikes me is that the people that look, people that are in travel love travel to an extent that I've never seen in any other industry. And so, you know, the, the no one got into travel to wait to make to force guests to wait 30 minutes in the check in queue. No one got into travel to like to it, make sure the guests were tightly boxed into a room type. You know, you're a double room, you're a triple room, you're a, you're a single with C view. People got into travel, hoteliers got into travel to really you know, provide incredible experiences and incredible hospitality for people. And so, you know, the COVID has certainly enormously helped this in that people institutionally are now more in a position to take risks and to try new things. Um, but like fundamentally, since I got here, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone, anyone without ideas of what they want to travel to become. Um, and, and, and so that's, you know, and, and that's what we enable. And so, yeah, I'm very excited every time I meet, like I'm in a hotel now and I met the general manager of this hotel yesterday and I was telling her what we we're doing. And it's just, you know, the, 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 she you know, talking about like, oh, you know, we'd have loved to do this, but we just actually haven't been able to do it because the system doesn't support it, you know? So yeah. I was like, attribute based pricing goes, so really exciting. Is that, I was going to say, you must talk to a lot of hoteliers, particularly on that supply side. And obviously you mm. also talk to retailers on the, on the, on the on sales side as well. But when, when you talk to hoteliers, there's obviously in, in travel, like, like all um, industries where there are strong intermediaries and there's a distribution network, there's always this dichotomy between going direct and selling through a third party that is a professional retailer and considers themselves to own the customer and so on. And there's all, and, that, and in travel, that's always been the case. And there's always this dichotomy: how much, how much direct business do you want? And, and hotels always tell you they want more. They'll, they'll take 100% if they could. But, but actually, um, maybe this dichotomy sometimes is, um, is not helped by the, by the, by the current situation where dealing with third parties is a, either a costly or b problematic, and, and make those two things probably come, come together. So, so does this way of doing things? Um, suggest uh, a future where intermediaries and suppliers can work more collabor collaboratively and understand the value each other brings and have be, be less sort of in, in battle to own the customer, which seems to be one thing that really epitomizes this, this industry. Well, I, I think what's, what's fascinating about this is that you have you, most hotels, yeah, indeed, most hotels would talk about the distribution strategy and say, we want more direct you know, bookings. And clearly that makes sense, right? Clearly you would. But actually, you know, when you get into it, most hotels can can probably increase their direct booking percentage by you know, three, four percent with with extreme effort. And they're always going to need someone to help them sell rooms. Like just given you know, by the very nature of the fact that this hotel is in Barcelona, it means that they can't really speak to like the right audience for a, a traveler in, in Kenya or in, you know, in Western Sahara, because they're just different places geographically and those people have different browsing patterns. Um, and, and so hotels are acutely aware of this, right? And, and I think 
you know, when we speak to them, one of the really interesting things that they want to be able to do, one of the things they want to be able to do is to work with as many partners as they can that suit their brand, right? So they, 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 they don't want to sit there and just have a, a strategy that is direct and booking.com for everyone else. They want to have a strategy that is direct as much as we can get and lots and lots of different sellers bringing us the right kinds of travelers that, you know, whether that's a sort of a, a business traveler or whether that's a long stay traveler, whatever it might be for that specific hotel. Um, and so like a, you know, hotels, the, the thing that holds them back right now is just the systems can't support that many different, you know, that many different, um, many different sellers. And even if the systems yeah. can, their own payment reconciliation process and back office stuff can't support that many. So, you know, that's the promise of Impala. Now, as, as far as it goes there, the question of like, you know, customer ownership, the customer is, you know, I, I think that there's a, a little bit of, um, you know, when you have massive behemoth sellers, then they're always going to want to push further and further and further. You know, they're always going to want to obfuscate the email address that you get as a hotelier so that you just do not have any ownership of that customer whatsoever. We see it very differently, which is to say that like, the customer is jointly owned by the seller and the hotel themselves. And the moment that that customer arrives for, for, for check-in, you know, that moment that customer walks through the door, that traveler becomes the hotel's customer for the, for the, you know, until they check out essentially. And so how do you facilitate that? You just have transparency across the board. So you essentially make sure that, you know, that everyone has the same information about the, about the, the traveler. Um, and, and I don't think you need to, you know, five, 10 years from now, I don't think we're going to have these, these questions of like, well, who owns the customer? Why do you have data that I don't have access to? There's just too much leverage on the size of those very, very large OTAs, I would say. Yeah, and actually, and data ownership is going to become more problematic anyway going, going forward as, as regulations come in. What 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 do you think COVID's done to the market and um, to the bend to to, bend, to, to to travel in general? Do you think do you think COVID's changed things for the long term? If if so, what has changed for the long term? Yeah, indeed. So I, I think the it's it's really destroyed certainty. I think, and mm -hmm. you know, if you if if we'd have gone back two or three years so pre COVID and said you know, and spoke to a, ho a hotelier in, in, in the Costa del Sol, like a resort owner in the Costa del Sol, you know, they would know for a fact that they were going to fill at 97%, you know, in June, July, or August, and that 40% of that was going to come from bed banks. And, you know, 30% of that was going to come from direct tour operators and 20% was going to come from, you know, the large OTAs. And, and like, you know what, that's fine. You know, okay, we want more direct and yada, yada, yada. But like, you know, that's kind of how it works. Um, and they'd be able to tell you the destiny, you know, the origin of their travelers. And now none of that is true. You know, there's a, you know, all of that, all of those, those old supply lines, all of those old travel corridors have, you know, either be totally, either been totally destroyed or atrophied. And so the world of travel is very, very different just in terms of how people are traveling. Um, and that means that, you know, hoteliers specifically have to be really fast on their feet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's actually, you know, that's sort of one of the reasons why Impala is doing so well is because post COVID or, you know, mid COVID hoteliers sat there and said, you know, damn, we can't, like, we just, we can't fill it at, like, 90% and, 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 and finish the day at, like, at six o'clock. We have to, like, work around the clock to figure out how we're going to fill our hotel with the right people at the right time. Um, and, and the promise, clearly, of open distribution is the promise that, like, you will be able to work with people that can get you the, the right travelers at the right time. Yeah, and, and that uncertainty, that, that's been felt not only by the hoteliers, but it's been felt by the consumer as well. So, the consumer is looking to use brands it knows it trusts with it with their money and all that stuff that seems to be a really powerful thing so that again again that 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 plays into the hands of that more local maybe trusted intermediary than than potentially dealing with a hotel brand you've never heard of in a foreign country you want to visit but but you, you're not so sure about the brand itself indeed actually that's what, one thing that we've always seen in in areas where inherent trust is lower so, you know, I, I guess, you know, Asian travelers coming to Europe where there is a much higher burden to trust someone because like it's a different continent, you're very far away, you don't speak the same language, have always preferred to travel with arranged tours, right? And so yeah. like this, you know, that we see across the board. We, we also see really interestingly that there is, that the, the people that, you know, in that love travel, really love travel, maybe don't work in the industry, et cetera. This, you know, with, with the shift to remote working that most people have, there is this sense of travel by default, right? There is a sense of like, I'm going to travel and you're going to continue traveling and I'll arrange my life around that. And so we're starting to see some really interesting business models emerge for subscription travel, right? And TripAdvisor Plus came out the gate very early on and said, we're going to do this and then rode that back. But there's some really interesting companies like Safara, you know, like, you know, in various different places that are trying to 
you know, they're taking this subscription, but Citizen M, the subscription approach to, to their own hotels, really, really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, we've got a we've got a session on subscription models in the in the summit. Not only B two C, but even B two B with tech companies now saying, look, let's not tie you in. Let's let's give you the, the the technology on subscription, and you can drop it whenever you like. But obviously, we hope it works for you. Therefore, you won't you won't drop it. So there seems to be a move in that direction you know, across across the board. To be honest, it's a, yeah, I, I think that I think the subscription models for for BT Travel is is just absolutely fascinating because there's yeah. a, there's an extent to which, and and I'm going to be incredibly boring now for a while, but there's an extent to which, like you know, the, the travel is an extension of your personal brand, right? Like the, I'm I'm staying in the Barra Star right now, not least because Barra Star is one of the many hotels connected to Impala. Thank you very much, Barra Star. But other hotels are available, and and, <laughs> and are connected as well. But you know, it it but it is it suits my personal brand, right? This you know this hotel in Boston is is the kind of place that I, I, I like to be and I, you know would like to be known to be like um and so travel has always been an extension of personal brand and so subscription moving to a world of you know who is your travel provider is sort of the logical extension of that right and, and actually we've had that a little bit with you know this sort of well I travel I prefer Airbnbs or I prefer you know hosteling or I prefer like hotels and the sort of natural extension to that it you know might just be subscription models and my travel provider is Citizen M my travel provider is Marriott my travel provider is whoever it might be you know, design hotels. And, and we're not, certainly not to the end of that thought yet. There's still a little bit more thinking and, and, and market testing to do, but I think it's just bloody fascinating and that might be what the, the next 10 years is about. Yeah, good. But as, we, as we draw to an end, this is a, a quick chat about, about the situation currently in the market. You, you see it from your point of view. Certainly, uh, there seems to be growing optimism. Um, we've just seen every restriction lifted in the UK, but there, there are still issues around traveling around, which is understandable at the moment. But do, do you sense there's a, uh, growing optimism about travel and we are in a sort of post hopefully a post pandemic world now so i flew to australia on the 1st of march 2020 and about eight days later there was an announcement that Qantas was furloughing you know half of its staff mm -hmm. and it was putting these beautiful planes into into storage in you know in the northern territory essentially just sitting on time and, and i remember it being one of the most disheartening sad moments of my life with these beautiful planes with a Qantas logo that like for many people symbolizes adventure and travel um being being shelved and then you know what two days ago Australia opened up for travel again and so I think that there's nothing that I could say you know point to statistics of like, like clearly travel is, is booming in many 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 places but I think that typifies what we're seeing which is like the real end to the pandemic um, it's a really, people really symbolic, travel. symbolic moment, even if it doesn't mean a lot to a lot of travellers. It's, it it's, yeah. it, it's the message it gets, gets out there, I suppose. Well, the, the, the theme of the summit um, this year, as you know, is, is about putting your business into hyperdrive mode because we, obviously we feel the damage has been done. You know, every business in travel has got huge scars on its balance sheets over the last two years. This won't, this won't, be, this won't ease quickly and the damage will, be, will have to be uh, lived with for some time. But the quicker you can get yourself out of this situation, the better, clearly, because you know, mm. you'll start to see the revenues come back in. So, so I, I, I suppose you'll say, you know, look at companies like Impala to help you, but what, what is the key to bringing you out of this at, at speed so that you can put this period behind you if you're a travel company? Yeah, I, I think you gotta focus on the travel that is there. Um, and not the travel that you want to be there, right? So like, what does that mean? Hotel revenue this year will be 92% of what it was in 2019. Mm -hmm. Airline revenue will be about 35%. And the reason for that is because like lots and lots and lots of people, you know, people still want to travel, they're just doing so slightly more domestically or slightly more locally. And so airlines are less necessary to do that in most areas than, than, than hotels are. And so for every company, I would say, you know, like there is traveler demand, you know, which is focus on addressing it rather than thinking about, you know, you know the, how you would have done so two years ago and it's about adapting quickly and yes clearly i would say that impala is a great tool to do that but but ultimately whether you choose impala or whether you choose someone else um, or whether you're not even in the hotel space like adapting to face that traveler demand as it comes back very quickly I think yeah. is, is, and, and do you think is is, is choosing the right is technology key to this i mean technology is in, in everything there was, a, there was a time maybe when the industry thought technology wasn't going to be so important or they didn't need an internet they didn't need a web a website etc i mean those days are long gone but but is technology even now today still so important to keep ahead of the curve so that you are absolutely forging ahead rather than sort of waiting behind the leading absolutely and and what and and in very simple terms the reason for that is because technology allows you 
to map supply to demand very, 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 very frictionlessly. Um, and so the old days where, you know, you couldn't do that, you have no idea who was going to buy your hotel room at what point in time, and therefore you needed the bed bank to sit in between so that you could guarantee occupancy. What technology allows you to do through Impala, through many other means as well, is to say, great, there's demand here, we have supply, let's match it at a price that makes sense for both of us. Yeah. And so technology is vital in an uncertain market to help figure out where that, where that demand is coming from. Yeah. Look, Ben, our time's up, so I'm going to have to draw it to a close there. But it's been great chatting to you. And I think, you know, great to see, I think, you reflect the passion in the industry, which you talk about seeing other people for the product and, and for what travel's all about. I think it's absolutely correct. And anybody who's been in travel even much longer than you have been will reflect on that and, um, and also agree that this is a, an industry that's full of people with passion for the product. So, so thanks for joining us today, Ben. We look forward to hearing from Lionel at the Travelution Summit on May the 4th. They're very excited to have him speak and uh, to hear what he has to say. Um, so thanks again and uh, wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Lee, fantastic. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you.